is a real life uh, preparation of a demo and oh sorry okay ah. Th like that okay thank you very much for uh, offering me this opportunity thank you as thank you uh, you uh, all I have developed a system web pontoon uh, which is a framework for implementing web application that can be programmed online that's the whole history so what I would like to show you is th th the system has two views, administrator or end user programmer view and final end user view. So I will sh start by sh showing you the administrator view and then how uh, final end user will uh, see the application once it has been configured by the end user. As an example, I have uh, selected a communication between Twitter and uh, uh, traffic info website. I will give you more details. Then I will execute that activity as, an, as a final end user. And then I will show how life cycle, execution life cycles are managed by the system. And so finally, an overview of the system catalogs after the execution. So just a few words about the example. Uh, so two level, uh, a, a web application that can be used at two levels. I wanted to illustrate how existing components could be reused inside my framework. I wanted to uh, explain, illustrate how existing web servers and information streams could be integrated into Web, web applications like mine, like the, the one that I'm going to show you how this application can communicate with existing media like social networking systems. And uh, so uh, showing the relative facility that the system offers to non-programmer end users so as they define their, their own logic and uh, also how far the, the system, the, the language is expressive. And please don't try to find any real life usability to this example. This has not been a goal because it's supposed to be a real, really simple example uh, in, in five minutes demo. So just a few words about the implementation. I built on the top of Seaside and Pure CMS. And I deploy the system, I implement using both. I started by Squeak, and now I have switched to Faro for practical reasons, and I deploy on Faro VAMs, uh, Faro uh, images, and so Linux VAMs. So uh, the starting point of this demo has been two uh, components posted, contributed by the community. The first one is that this Twitter uh, interface com uh, contributed by Andras Rab. Uh, recently, two weeks ago, the other one is a, a component implemented during the London Campus Small Talk uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, so communicated by Nick Eger. The idea of the so I started by these two components. I wrap them according to my 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 framework requirements, and it gives a few services. So the first one is how to log into uh, Twitter. The, the second one, getting information from that website about the traffic info, so which returns a string. The other one is interactive tweeting with, so uh, uh, t sending messages to Twitter. Actually, uh, the default message is going to be the traffic info that we fetch from that website in London. And the result is a Twitter communication. What has been communicated to Twitter and uh, whether Twitter has accepted that communication. And I have also a specific uh, type of atomic services, what in my system is called atomic services. Actually, control flow constructs are not hard coded in the, in the framework. They are added, they can be added according to the requirements of the end users. So here, a while, while true is also a contract or a, an atomic service. The example is a login to Twitter and while true, while Twitter returns back true, execute two simple uh, actions, get uh, the, the traffic info and send Twitter. Thank you. 
So let's go to the demo. Oops, sorry. Okay. So th th this is an example application, the view for administrators or end user programmers. So the system comes with, actually behind the scene it's uh, PRCMS, so you can simply add any, any type of content that PRCMS allows you. And on the top of that, I have added this end user programmability functionality. Uh, for that, we need a set of uh, catalogs. The system comes with uh, a description of its primitive functionality. So this design is my son's, uh, Goya's uh, design. So uh, I asked him to find a metaphor for you know, primitive things and then you combine them to, uh, to, to achieve more complex concepts and then about life cycles. So uh, this uh, uh, is quite representative of what happens in this system. First of all, the contracts or uh, description of the system's atomic services in different categories. So here you have argument, communication, control flow, dialogue, like if I go to communication category of contracts, you have batch tweeting, interactive tweeting, latest traffic info information. So this is how I have wrapped those components that I showed you, community contributions as contracts, and you can edit and actually use it in the by the by the by through, through this interface online. Uh, I will go into more details later while programming the example that I showed you. The second one are the concepts of your system. So the, the, the web app exposes its internal concepts to the administrator or end user programmer. So here you have address, boolean, credit card, order, string, Twitter connection. Actually here you have a mixture of two, three domain specific modeling languages because I wanted to show different I use this website as a platform for demonstrating different languages for shopping, uh, uh, modeling activity, shopping activity. There is also about content management activities and also this Twitter example. But normally there is only one domain specific modeling language when the web app is deployed. So the other one, the last one is about the, the activities that the end user programmer or uh, administrator has added to the system. Activities are also organized in categories or themes, sorry. So here you have two themes. Let's add in a new activity to the system, the Twitter. So li like here, communication. This is a new theme of activities. So now I'm administrator, okay? So I'm end user programmer, I'm using this to add the, the activity that I just defined, how to communicate to Twitter. Uh, so I, I, I've added my communication theme now, the Twitter example. So attribute is the, only, so the title is the only attribute for defining uh, an activity and then let's design the activity. Activities are designed simply by adding actions and operations. So an activity is, an, uh, is a set of actions and each action is a set of operations, that's all. So the main, the main action is going to be, let me, I have just copied and pasted. To define an operation, you need to give the name of the contract, the, 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 which wraps, gives a name to the primitive code, to the primitive logic that you have wrapped by the contract. So the first action is going, operation, sorry, is going to log in to Twitter. Okay, just two minutes. Let me. So you, you have the, 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 the first operation is log in to Twitter. The second operation is going to be, okay while while true which is in the uh, uh, flow control okay I don't remember where so let's go and fetch that uh, uh, fetch that uh, contract which is in the control flow category which is while true so I select this while true this is the string that I was trying to type at control flow, 
Okay, then now you have, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So you have at, uh, this while true contract n requires an action as argument. Like in a small talk, you can pass a block as argument to your operation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the time is over. <laughs> okay, if you need to see the, the end of the demo, I would be happy to. <laughs> Okay. Hello, uh, I'm Dijon Lund, and well, I'm not going to do what the promise is. I'm not going to talk about my project. Uh, I started in a, a small talk uh, a small year ago, uh, so small talk is relatively new for me. Uh, I have a background uh, of about 10 years program experience, mainly in Java, but also some in Delphi, some, some in C Sharp. Uh, and I started a project vBridge and thinking, okay, Smalltalk is open source, I should make a contribution. What can I tell about the project? Maybe the library has some cool things in it. But I think that I can tell you something better that I can tell you next year, namely, what are my first experiences with Smalltalk? And I think that's a better learning experience than my first project. So. This is all I'm going to show you about my project now. If you want to see more, come and see me. Yeah, that's a Seaside application. It's a, a Seaside firmware application that is deployed on glass. Uh, well, I like small talk. I plan on doing it a long time. I, uh, yeah, well, it's flexible, it's powerful, it's really great. You can make web applications really fast. Uh, and yeah, I hope to use it for a long time. And starting up, okay, I, as expected, a new language takes always time to learn, and especially the image concept was really something I had to get used to. But okay, I got over it. The desktop menu, okay, you need to find it, but once you found it, it works. It works fine. So no problems there. Also, the workspace, yes, you have to manipula manipulate your image, so you need a workspace uh, once in a while. Uh, but once you find it, it works fine. So is the glass browser. And the debugger, yeah, it's really great. I work more and more in the debugger, and yeah, it really works, as you all know. But then I started using the tools, the tools I needed to do my work. And I started using Monticello to uh, deploy my packages. And uh, as I said, I work in Faro Seaside as my development image, and I deploy it to Glass. So I save it in Monticello and then import it in Glass. And at first glance, it works very good. It's easy to use. You simply say, OK, I have a package. Save the package. OK, you need to select, select the repository. But that's just configuring the tool. Nothing difficult there. But when you want more of it, yeah, you, you only have your package. It it's doesn't really break up. And once you break up your packages, you actually like Monticello to follow it, but it still has that main package. And so I was a bit disappointed there. And it has some serious cross dialect issues. Uh, saving uh, my code works fine on Faro. I try to load it in Glass, and Glass just says, well, there's something wrong within the MCZ, but uh, there's a wrong character, so I don't understand it. And you find out that, that you've introduced some euro sign in, uh, somewhere in your code. And you say, okay, well, I, should, I shouldn't do that anymore. But, well, uh, there are more characters like it. And they're hard to find when, when they just say, I don't understand your MCZ. And your MCZ grows because, well, you only have the package. And etc cetera, etc cetera. and i was 
often pleasantly surprised, but that's actually uh, a bad thing because I was pleasantly surprised I found a feature I never found before that was somewhere hidden in the user interface that I would have hoped to have found much, much earlier. But uh, and I then I found chain sets because I couldn't do everything with Monticello, so I needed more and I learned I have chain sets as well. I actually used them a lot already, not knowing that I did because well it's cause uh, it helps me to to uh, get my method history, which is really great it's uh, and uh, also the drag and drop when I have a change set, I just drop it in my image and uh, I it gets imported really great, but yeah, I couldn't find my change sets. It was somewhere I should have started a change sorter, I now know. And then in the change sorter, I have a menu option that I can manipulate my change sets. But well, um, and who's going to find that? Well, someone who has used Smalltalk a lot, but not when you're just starting. So also here for this tool, the discoverability of your features is really poor. And then I thought at a certain point, I want to use Peer because Peer has a lot of functionality that, that really is great, that looks great, and I've seen the demo. I used the demo and I, I, I played around with it and I thought, yes, I want this functionality. So I started digging in in what Peer was really about, what's wha what made Peer ticking and how I could use it. And I had a certain thing I wanted to do with it. And after a few hours puzzling, looking through code, I still had no improvement in the direction I wanted. I s just wanted a simple feature and only that feature. I didn't want to log on, I didn't want every other th stuff, I simply wanted one of the features of Peer. And I couldn't do it within a few hours, so I simply, I gave up. I said, that cliff is too high for me. I'm sorry. Maybe someday I will learn peer, but not now. I'm going to build it myself. So that's, that's a bit my conclusion about small talk. It, it, has, it is a great language with, with really great potential, and I hope to use it it uh, a long time after. I'm really enthusiastic about it, so don't get me wrong about uh, me criticizing some of the stuff. But I think many libraries, uh, uh, when when I encounter libraries, I can't use after a few hours. They're simply no good. And peer may may be great for expert users, but for uh, for me not yet. And Discoverability of, of features within tools and libraries is a problem within Seaside. And uh, yeah, then I also stumbled on some odd things that the collection uh, terminology didn't fo follow the mathematical uh, terminology. So I still make mistakes there. I still like to have an element contains, of a collection contains an element and then it, sa it says it isn't a block, my element. Yeah, of course it isn't a block. I ask whether it contains it. I don't ask any satisfy. But well, contains is any satisfy and includes actually is contains and includes all is actually the includes and the includes, uh, what was it? The includes any is the intersects. But well, okay. I simply, when I use something like that, I need to find out. Uh, the tooling has the same problem as the libraries, so a lot of people I've met here and I've seen here on the dashboard have uh, a lot of their own tools, which are easy to make, which, but it's, yeah, it's, uh, and my conclusion is also that uh, the one-click cl tutorial is, r uh, is really good. It helps you start up with a simply, you download it from the web, you follow the videos, and you can make your own application. But 
you really need a mentor to uh, get further in, s in small talk. And not all people have a mentor. And that's, I think, uh, prohibits the, uh, the community from growing. I really like to see the community grow with, with more enthusiasti enthusiastic people. So I think that we need to improve our environment to a point where you can learn on the job. So this is a call for awareness. Here in Fire and Squeak, we are an open source community. And to make it work, we need to improve libraries and tools to make them more accessible, to make them simply you can learn on the job. And we can't rely on just a few people doing a lot of work because... <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> Thank you. I can start. Does this work? Okay. I can start talking right now because the first th couple things aren't on a slide. Um, I'm going to be talking about bibli Biblio Cello. And basically, I think, uh, you know, I came up with the name Biblio Cello several, oh, last year sometime, last summer. And, um, and the idea of Biblio Cello had to do with Metacello, obviously. Uh, where you use a configuration, you have a database, a repository of uh, MCZ files, and you use a configuration to do searches into um, this repository, all right? Kind of like a squeak source, but with directed searches. And so that was the idea a year ago, and it's, you know, something, something for the future. And of course, uh, recently, um, with the uh, uh, instability of squeak source, it became, um, you know, something that I started thinking about, well, maybe there needs to be something, you know, replacing squeak source coming along a little faster. And so the thought process at that time, um, which is not too many, you know, several months ago, was uh, uh, several people, I think Tobias Pape and James and uh, Philip Marshall have been working on Squeak Source 3, which is a Squeak Source that runs on top of uh, Seaside 3.0. And so the idea was, um, well, let's see now, I've been using uh, uh, the Google uh, code projects. And you had a wiki, you have issue tracking, you have source code control, well, but that's in SVN, so never mind. So it's like halfway there, half of what you need. And I thought, okay, I'll take um, Squeak Source 3, add issue tracking. And then I discovered that Philippe had done a very nice restful interface into Squeak Source 3. And I thought, I've been dying to be able to have, do direct navigation with the restful URL to every one of those tabs on your Squeak Source page. So I started adding that. And of course, uh, around that time, I actually sat back and said, well, doggone it, doesn't Peer do that? All right, and I had this dream of Metacello, of the Bibliocello, and um, started thinking, well, let's see now, if we have Peer for doing the, the wiki, add uh, Seaside components with uh, issue tracking, um, repository lists, um, anything, because you can do Peer add-ons, and it would be very easy for people to build basically wikis that do project management. And so then the second idea is a, a web API. So not only just for doing the DAV style downloading and uploading packages to the, to, to the Bibliocello repository, but you know, managing projects, adding projects, removing projects, manipulating uh, Monticello files, um, and whatever else other commands are out there. So you have a web API. And then the third thing is, is we have this repository of MCZ files that are you know, let's load all of Squeak Source into this thing and make it all searchable, all right? And 
put together a uh, bibliocello site, uh, took, did this on top of Seaside 3.0 with glass, loaded, I've got, I don't know, a couple hundred MCZ files in there, and the idea is that we're doing um, uh, context-specific searches. So in your image, you expect to do senders, implementers, references to, cla to classes or, um, or globals, and that's what um, put into uh, Bibliocello. And i uh, give you the, the one piece on the inside, then I'll go, go do a, dump a demo. But what I've done is taken MCZ files, unzipped them, cracked them open, and using the uh, Monticello definitions, I now have information about methods that are in the, <coughs> in the MCZ file and classes that are defined. Um, then I ported uh, the RB uh, AST uh, stuff into Gemstone so I could parse the, the, the small talk uh, methods. And then I can get uh, senders and uh, implementers and references. So anyway, that's basically the technology that's here. Um, like I said, I'll do a demo real fast, but I, I, would, I do want to say one more thing. The idea of Bibliocello is obviously I'm very organized and have a presentation because this is more like an incubator for a replacement of squeak source than it is a replacement of squeak source. You know, I'm pushing the boundaries and I'm hoping that other folks help push the boundaries for, you know, how can we use peer to, um, to extend uh, package management for, uh, for the site? Um, what kinds of uh, models do we use for doing searches and controlling the scoping of searching and viewing search results? Because there's like, we can, there's, you, if you think about all of Squeak Source, cracked open, version history for every method that was ever there. That's a lot of data and a lot of things to look at, and of course you don't want to see it all. So anyway, I'll just jump in here and, uh, and uh, navigate around the site a little bit. All right, so where am I? Um, let me go to the home site, the home page. What is this? Uh, yeah, uh, so there's the disclaimer. This is an experimental website. I'm going to bring it down. Cr if, you know, I'm going to crash it. You know, but, so don't put anything there in import that, that's important. Now, I do have a, uh, a user model in here. So there, is, there, is a, uh, uh, ad, uh, there are passwords in here. But I think you can guess what they are. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to tell you what they are. Um, so let's go to, uh, just to give you an idea with uh, Seaside 3.0, I'll jump in here. So I've jumped to the Seaside 3.0 project. Um, here is the uh, list of, uh, oh, and what you've noticed now is I've gone in to the Seaside project. I've gone into a repository versions, all right? If I click on the versions repository, oh, that's where I am. So I've got three different repositories there, all right? Click on the RC1 repository. And what I've got, what you've got is nested repositories within a project. So you have the opportunity to basically have more organization within a project than, than you get on Squeak Source today. So, um, and then I've got uh, Gemstone, Faro, and Squeak for those versions. And so those, those packages have been loaded, crack, cracked open into uh, Bibliocello. And uh, so here's, um, here's all the packages that are in the Squeak configuration for Seaside 3.0 that are required. Um, if I pick a package and click on it, what you get, did I click on it? Yeah. What you get is, you notice the list here of undefined globals sent but not implemented in source. So this is the basic information that you have when you just crack open a repository. Uh, oops, now I've done it. <laughs> da, 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 timer, timer. Um, yeah. Um, so I've got a list of classes that aren't defined within the context of that MCZ file, all right, that are referenced. And uh, those could be super class. Mo most likely they're super classes because this is experimental still. The sent but not implemented are the messages that are sent and not implemented within that MCZ file. So these are interesting things. And this is more, okay, this information is available, all right, and we can do things with it. Now, the UI here, I'm not a UI guy, all right, but... You know, like I say, this is an incubator. And so if I scroll down, we now look at the source code in from this package, all right? Here's the GR package class, Seaside email, you know, the implementation. Oh, I got shout in there so I could get syntax highlighting. Um, so now if I click on Seaside email, it's going to do uh, a, 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 a senders search of Seaside email. Ah, zero, okay. So what I'll do here is go to the spot that I know I, a, a better demo for that. Um, so I'll go into the example project. Um, 
And the notion of the search is that I'm in the example project, so when I search for foo in the source, I'll end up with a list of all the, okay, 22 definitions within the, was, which is in the, that context. And what you get is information about this project, like this class is defined in this MCZ file. This method is defined in that MCZ file, and if I scroll down, we can find some. But now if I click on baseline 30, oh, I, that, that was the wrong one, too. There's no senders of that. Okay. And I'm, I'm right on schedule. <laughs> because what I'm going to do is use the, uh, the feature of getting rid of the configurations, because you notice that was the, uh, the name of the class that, that it was looking at. So now I'm looking at real guys that are real methods, all right? And um, so I'm going to click on Biblio or on Foo, and there are senders of Foo, all right? And uh, here it is. Now I've got a fast CGI, Dale Hendricks, all right? That some package that's in the repository. Because when I do the searches right now, again, this is experimental. I went back out to the outermost context and searched through the whole repository for that. And um, so now I can click on the, repos on, on, uh, the Dale H. Let's see if there's others. Oh, yeah. This one, I've got test error initialization that shows up in two different packages, all right? Grease test core and grease test core. One's Lucas, one's from Dale. Um, those are just different versions. So that just happens that we, I've, I've loaded both of those Monticello files in there. Um, yeah, that's probably good enough. And uh, we'll, test, we'll click on the test error because I think this will do a, a search for senders of test error. So oh, that was a bad one to pick. And that's not what I want to click on. How do I do that? This arrow up here. Oh, okay. What did I click on? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I think you click just below okay. it. Okay. So I'll just go in and say um, I want to find implementers of foo and do that. So anyway, that's basically, you know, this is basically the site. This is the idea, you know. It's a demonstration, and thank you very much. <laughs> No, no, uh, new or Yeah, yeah, in difference. Oh. Display. Another one. Arrangements, arrangements. No, no. no. Oh. Hello. Okay, so I'm going to talk today. Have we started start the clock? Uh, about uh, <laughs> CFOX, which is um, 
a plugin for, for Firefox, and it, it brings Seaside into Firefox. Um, and we'll start with a demo. So, so hopefully you're all familiar with this um, this screen, the Welcome to Seaside screen. And I don't know if you can see at the bottom here. There's a little Seaside um, uh, starfish. If I click on that then magically it's transformed the HTML on this page into um, Seaside render method. So you get an update route and a, a render content on. Now, just to prove that this is going to work, I'm going to take this code and create a Seaside, a new Seaside component based on this code. So let's see if this works. Okay, so I create a new method here. Um, WA. Okay, so there I've got a render, render content on method, and I'm going to just add a update root method. And then I will quickly... Uh -huh. um, ah, I should have practiced on a smaller screen, I think. Um, WA admin. Does anyone remember what I called our demo component? Okay. application, okay. Oh. Register. Tab, yeah. Oh. Register. Demo component. <laughs> oh. oh, no. <laughs> Thanks for the pressure, guys. Okay. Okay, so... Now, if I go back to the browser, uh, localhost 8080, um, browse. Okay, we see demo. Aha! And uh, well, the, the links will actually take you back to the original, the original welcome screen, because I haven't... Clearly, you'd have to refactor it then. Okay, so I've got a few slides. So why, why did I bother doing this? I would have loved to have something like this when I was learning Seaside. Um, I found it quite hard to map between my knowledge of HTML and the Seaside render methods. Um, and secondly, uh, the kind of workflow when you're developing a website, typically you've got a web designer, a graphic designer, and a Seaside developer. And uh, the... Graphic designers, I know, they, they work in something called Dreamweaver, which is an HTML layout package. And then there's, there's a kind of mismatch. How do I take their HTML and bring it into Seaside? Um, so my initial, my initial plan was to build a Dreamweaver plugin. Um, but then I thought, well, that won't cover all of the, um, all of the graphic designers out there. Then I thought maybe I'll use Smalltalk and use an, H uh, an HTML parser in Smalltalk, but they seemed a little bit old, and I was a bit worried that they wouldn't be completely correct. Um, so finally, I came up with the idea of doing a Firefox plugin. Um, there's, uh, so there's a package that generates the Firefox pack plugin. It's called cfox.xpi. Um, there's mainly two parts of it. There's a parser.js, which is static, 
and an element attribute mapping.js, which is auto-generated from the seaside source. Um, so the problem is, how do I map from um, an HTML render method? Here we've got a list item um, into an unordered list. Oops, that should be, that's wrong, never mind. Um, and so how do I map HTML elements and how do I map HTML attributes? Um, so initially I thought that uh, looked very simple. You've got a nice hierarchy of brushes here in, um, in Seaside. Um, if you look at um, the unordered list, um, then you can see it creates an unordered uh, list tag brush. Uh, and you look at the tag. Ha! Ah, that should be UL. Anyway, um, uh, so you can, kind of, you can map, between, map between the two quite well there. That was my initial plan, but unfortunately that didn't work because you've got lots of tags that don't create their own brushes. They just use a generic brush. Um, so, for example, code doesn't have its own tag brush. Um, it just creates a generic brush and passes in code. And same with block quote. And there's a whole series of them that don't work. So instead, I ended up using um, object as met method wrapper. Um, and what I do is I create a canvas and I iterate o over all the, the methods on the canvas. And I wrap the brush um, method, and, and that enables me to extract whether it's a custom brush or a generic brush, the brush that's been used for that particular element, and then from that I can, using the previous thing, I can extract the, the actual HTML tag. So that builds me up a lovely uh, mapper, and I guess if we go to... <laughs> Um, hmm, not that one. Okay. Uh, Cfox. Dot. Um, C side. Oh. <coughs> Just doing this so you checking you're paying attention. Okay. Um, So here you can see what, I've, what, what I end up building up. So I ended up building up um, a list of tags and then um, the associated render method and then the attributes. So for example, if we click on, yeah, it's a bit small, you can't really see, but there's a pop-up here that lists all the attributes associated with um, the anchor tag. Um, so that's, I, I use that to generate, da, 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 da. Um, one minute left. <laughs> uh, to generate this auto um, auto mapping, and that feeds into the parser, and then well, you can see it all works beautifully. Now, there's lots of inter implementation fudges. There are various tags I have to ignore because they overwrite tags that we're interested in. Header tags are quite painful doing title, script, and style. Um, it's a 1.0 release, so the mapping, I'm afraid, isn't perfect. Often it comes across attributes it doesn't understand, and it, it, it uses this unmapped attribute comment. Um, and also, uh, if you try and convert it for a huge page of HTML, you get this compiler problem where you've got more than uh, 256 literals, um, and it can't, you can't actually <laughs> generate your, um, you can't actually paste your uh, render content on method in. Um, so to solve that, what I'd love to do is actually integrate with Firebug so that um, I'm sure a lot of us use Firebug um, so that you could select uh, an attribute and uh, you know, use, the, use the HTML selector in Firebug and then that would actually dynamically tell you what the um, uh, seaside uh, mapping was for that bit of HTML and then that would get, get over this um, uh, problem of too many literals. Um, mm, 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 mm. Obviously, bug fixes and syntax color highlighting. Um, and I'd also love to experiment with it in um, serializing the DOM as, as JSON. Ah.
Anyway, feedback would be great. So, uh, is David uh, here? David uh, Gorisek. Okay. I don't uh, know if I uh, said your name correctly. Yes. Hi, my name is da uh, David Gorisek. <laughs> but uh, it's David Gorisek. So, uh, I had, actually, I wanted to present, I had three projects to choose from. Next is uh, Christian Heider, so uh, you better be preparing. And uh, Alexandre Bergel. Bergel? Okay. Okay, so I have I had three projects to choose from, and one was XJS integration with Seaside, the other one was um, source tracking system for New Dolphin 6.1, not working. Okay, so uh, one project was XJS integration with Seaside, the other one was uh, a source tracking system for the New Dolphin 6.1. And uh, the, the last one was online ERP that we are doing in Dolphin Small Talk. And since there are a lot of seaside projects and none for Dolphin, I chose the Dolphin project. <laughs> so let me show you um, what we are doing in Dolphin. But uh, I wouldn't talk about Dolphin, I would just talk about Small Talk because the software that we are writing is always. Uh, uh, portable across all small talk, small talk dialects. So this is the, let me make it a little, this is our web application. If you have a, your own company and uh, you have to be uh, in, contact on in contact with accountants, then you're probably familiar with uh, this type of software. Uh, it's like, uh, if you know online QuickBooks or Zero or uh, packages like this, it's uh, it's online ERP for small to medium uh, sized businesses. So we have uh, started developing this software in uh, 2002, and uh, it was uh, it was a little ahead of its time because people weren't uh, used uh, to. Um, online to having <laughs> applications online there were a lot of doubts if people will use this or, or if they will uh, trust us to run uh, their software and uh, store their data but uh, the thing uh, I mean the, the this type of software which is now very popular j just got on and uh, we are now actually the biggest uh, provider for uh, software as a service uh, in this field of, uh, of business in Slovenia. But Slovenia is small, so we are still small. <laughs> um, so, uh, but we have also Slovenian and Croatian and Serbian localization, and we also got uh, translation of software to Spanish and Portuguese languages, so uh, it is expanding. Um, and uh, what can you do with it? You can log in as, for instance, into a, an, a, a demo account like John Smith. Uh, and then you can make new invoice, for instance. Just you can just use the keyboard. Uh, select a product, so for instance, something like this, one item, and etc. Click here, select a buyer. Uh, let's make something 
uh, something like this. Then you can issue invoice. Okay, well somebody was playing with it and. Okay. Uh, hmm. that's, yeah, that's a problem with test databases. There's always someone who spoils the data. Uh, so, okay, we can do it on the 31st of December. So, uh, when you issue invoice, you can print it uh, with, uh, with Adobe, or you can use any Word template, etc. And um, uh, then you can also do things like e-banking, payroll, uh, purchasing, and uh, any, any type of uh, of uh, daily tasks that uh, entre entrepreneur entrepreneurs or accountants do, or any other employee within uh, uh, a regular company. Uh, uh, and the, the best thing about this software is that um, it is um, it is very um, it is very light. It is uh, everything is uh, done in small talk from the web server, web frameworks. Uh, um, of, of course, the, the we are using PostgreSQL, so the, the driver to the database is also done in Smalltalk. So we have full control of the software. There's none, there are no none uh, third party components whatsoever in th this software. So, uh, it and it also runs on, uh, on any Smalltalk dialect in this case, this runs on the Linux server uh, with Visual Edge virtual machine, but we develop it in .NET Smalltalk. So it is um, it is uh, uh, a very open <coughs> system, although not open source at the moment, and uh, can also be localized to any uh, other uh, uh, country specific localization. So it's like it's something uh, I always say. Uh, for Java, they've got uh, Open Bravo and Compare, uh, and for Smalltalk, we've developed this this system. And um, uh, if anybody is interested to uh, to uh, start running a similar business for for your own uh, country or in your own market, then uh, you can contact me. So that's the presentation. <laughs> Stopping it, and it's not running yet. Yep. Okay. 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 Good. Um, so I'm I'm a graphics guy. I like vector graphics, and I always like to have PDF output. So I have a product which does some graphics for newspapers and. The printing business is moving from EPS to PDF, so I want to have PDF. And not just the library <coughs> where I interface to, I want to have the PDF itself. And so I started to, I, I implemented the specification and I'm really excited about it because it's such a nice implementation, or such a nice specification. It was really fun to implement it. So um, I'm going to open source it. It will be a MIT license. It's done in <laughs> it's done in, in Visual Works, but I hope it's not a big deal to, to port it to some other dialects. Um, 
so to, to write a good writer for PDF, I think it's very important to have a good reader as well. So this is what I'm going to show you. Um, just an explorer for PDFs. So you see all the objects which are in PDF. Um, yeah, that's what I'm doing and I have no plan, so please interrupt me if you want to see something special. <coughs> <laughs> okay, so just here's a PDF. Ah. Come on. Here's a PDF generated from my program. So just graphics, right? So, and if I look into it, we'll see a lot of stuff. So let's start here. Um, that's the size in bytes, and I read 10 objects out of 14. So that means um, I'm, I'm reading only the objects I really need lazily. So you can drop big files in there and you just take the objects you need to display here in this, on the screen. Um, this top part is the document info. Oh, what's, what's this here? Ah, I have to get rid of that. Okay. The document info, which uh, contains all the, uh, well, uh, descriptive stuff about a PDF. Um, then you, so it starts actually with a trailer. Uh, so the, the PDF file is, or PDF itself, is just, okay, it's just an unordered list of objects. So they have objects, and in the end, there's a cross-reference list So to find the objects. But you don't actually need it. You can recreate this cross-reference list by just indexing all the objects in the file again. So the objects itself is basically dictionaries. Dictionaries with attributes, and that's it. And they're just cross-linked all over the place, and there are lots of specific uh, objects des described in the uh, specification, um, yeah, which is, so, stop. <coughs> There's some basic, basic types, which are implemented nicely, and all this object business with cross-references, but um, the specification is huge, 1,000 pages, but don't be worried. Don't be worried, it's nice. It's nice to read and nice to find things. But I just picked the stuff I needed and implemented those. So, but it's very easy to extend. Just look in the, in the specification, uh, read the two pages, important, and then implement that object. But if you have the basic infrastructure, all the objects can be shown. So I can, s I can show you some stuff. 160 tests, running. I think. Um, <coughs> so, okay, so you start with a trailer, which actually is at the end of the file, just before the cross-references, and it references mostly the root. It's a catalog object, which is, uh, well, the root for all PDF documents. And it mostly contains pages. I have just one page, of course. Page of kids, one page. So let's, let's look at the page. What is a page? <coughs> Here's this object, it's a dictionary, it has some, um, some attributes, like a type, a parent, a back pointer, um, some resources, whatever that might be, a media box, that's uh, important. So the green stuff is, um, also this exclamation mark means it's required for this object. These attributes are required, so it's definitely, uh, it's in the spec. So. The white ones are there, but they are not uh, required, and the gray ones, they are specified, but they are not required, and they are not here in that file. Okay, so let's, oh, another point is here, this object page is defined in PDF 1.3. Um, that means it cannot appear in this, in this shape in a PDF before 1.3. It is, uh, 1.3 because this attribute trim box is, uh, was added in 1.3. So this PDF needs to be at least 1.3. Uh, okay, so this is maybe a little bit better. Resources, they store fonts and uh, graphics attributes and colors and whatever. <coughs> so here you see a little bit more of this stuff. I clicked on an attribute, and what you see up here 
is the specification or the text from the specification. So I just copied it, and so you can see the, the description of the specification in the program for the object you are actually um, looking at. It has some attributes, like it's required and it's her inheritable. It has a, a type. So I explained the PDF version, and there are no required attributes, but these two are present here. And below, you can see that before, this is the source code. <coughs> so what you see is um, you have this kind of stuff, which is called a name, which is um, basically a symbol in, in Smalltalk. Um, and it's a dictionary with these attributes, initial GS and a font. This font has two children, F1 and F2, and it's a reference. So it references the object number four and the object number seven. So, um, and these of course expand further and further. That's basically it. So let's, let's look at something else which is not modeled so much. For example, uh, the PDF specification. So it takes, unfortunately, a little bit too long. As I said, it has about 1,000 pages. So <coughs> so now it reads all the objects. You see it's here reading more and more objects of these 125,000 ones which are in the file. You see that the pages can be arbitrarily structured. So now we are on page one. And so let's see something. So I modeled all these things which have these green things and, and stuff like that. But other, other objects I didn't model because I didn't, don't, don't need them. One minute. OK, OK. So let's see. Outlines. Yeah, outlines I didn't model. It's just a dictionary for me, but if you if you take care if you care of that, you, then you just implement that and define the stuff from the spec. It's basically copy paste and adapt the syntax, and that's it. So, but you can read it because the basic infrastructure is all there, right? Um, okay, very short time. I just want to show you something I didn't implement: an encrypted file. PDF can be encrypted, and there's an exception which is not so important. But you see, encrypted f means in PDF that every string is encrypted, not the structure. So you can inspect the structure very nicely. Of course, I'll oh, proceed, okay. Um, and the contents, the contents is very important. This describes the graphics of the page. So the contents is encrypted. But, oh, okay, one more thing. Sorry, I'm a little bit confused here. Um, there are special dictionaries which, which are called um, streams. It's used a lot. It's just a blob with some description of uh, how this blob... Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I've been working on, on code profiling. So I've been working on Kai, which is a profiler that gives me a very handy visualization. So the idea is not to use text-based information as you can have with message tele, but to have something a bit more graphical. So now I'm currently profiling a piece of code here, which uh, comes from uh, Mondrian. So yeah, I'm profiling Mondrian now, and here I can see the result using Mondrian itself. 
So here I can see like a bunch of classes. Those are the classes that are involved in the piece of code that I just profiled. And this is a class called MO root, and this is MO graph element. And inside there are inner boxes, and the inner boxes are methods. So the idea is quite simple, and more method is big, you know, bigger method is, more time it takes at execution. So this method, MO root, takes a lot of time, 72% of the execution, and it's very thin. It means that the method has been executed just once. And this method, is shorter, it takes 17% of the execution, and it's very dark. It means that the method has been executed on many different objects. And it's a bit wider, it means that it has been ex executed many times. So this is for the structure. Then doing right click, view invocation, and then you have the method called graph. And then here you can see the different graph, the different invocation between methods. The yellow method is very interesting. Those are the methods where you can potentially in, you know, install cache because these methods are likely to be functional. They don't do a side effect, and they always return the same value for the same receiver. Yeah, so this is what I wanted to show you. Then, um, yeah, so a few weeks ago, there is a receive, a, there were a bug issue in Mondrian saying that when, uh, when someone used uh, this scroll bar on the Mondrian view, then it was very slow. Then I tried to write a profiler for this, and then here I have a small uh, tool that indicates the messages that each instance of MO Edge receive. So when I do here this, uh, you know, when I move here the scroll bar, then instances of MO Edges receive some messages. Therefore, I have some some peaks. And the last thing I would like to show you is um, memory monitor that I, it just give me the memory consumption. So here this is, so for example here there is, um, yeah, there is some information about memory. And then now if I remove some windows, yeah, okay. And here I run the GC, then it goes down. Thank you very much. I have a li two little announcements to do. The first one is that I guess that there are four books left for uh, Seaside, if you want. The second one is that with uh, Henrik, we have some magic cards, and we could find other people to have a fight this evening. So you're welcome. He has really great decks. So, we had fun yesterday. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, in fact, I have two, two, two different presentations, two, two different projects, so maybe uh, I could have 20 minutes. <laughs> 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 no, okay, I will try to 10 minutes with two projects. Okay, the first one is... Um, uh, doing some uh, robotics with uh, with small talk, so uh, I'm working in a, in a robotic labs in uh, in Hanoi, and we are doing lots of stuff with robots, and we we need to uh, uh, connect to uh, some um, uh, simulation engine for uh, for doing robotics, and one of the m uh, most famous uh, robotics uh, simulation engine is Player Stage. So if you want to publish something in a Robotics, you need to uh, validate your result with this kind of software. So I, I do a very simple um, a client in Smalltalk for for connecting to this uh, simulation engine. So what is Player Stage? In fact, it's uh, it's, it's built in. Uh, there is two different software. Player, it is uh, an interface to connect to a variety of uh, different uh, sensors and robots. 
and uh, there is stage. Stage is uh, in fact a simulation engine, and in fact, if you want to uh, um, control a, a set of robots, you can use the same uh, program in order to. So they use the same interface. Uh, if you so with a single program, you can you are allowed to uh, control uh, the uh, simulation or the real robots. So it's very nice to to use this kind of software. Uh, I have a small demo. In fact, this is a video demo. Uh, so uh, I'm launching uh, players uh, simulation uh, stage simulation. Oh, okay. I need uh, to plug my uh <laughs> my laptop because I'm out of battery. Okay. Uh, so I, I launch uh, a, a stage simulation engine. Uh, in fact, this is a C++ uh, uh, based uh, simulation engine. It's very so it's a kind of 2D simulation. So we see the robot from the from above, and uh, from uh, s uh, inside. So this is a very old version of uh, Faro. And so I, I create, so this is a code to control the robot. This is a very simple uh, demonstration. So I create a, a, a proxy to connect to the player, uh, uh, to the stage uh, system. And after that, uh, I could uh, create um, object for that are proxies for, for every sensors and ac um, uh, of, the, of the robots, and I could Program the robots. In fact, in small talk. So, and uh, for example, this is uh, a very simple robot with some sensors. This is, I think, it's some sonar sensors. And I move the robot <laughs> uh, uh, close to one obstacle, and uh, the robot, uh, in fact, uh, just wander and uh, uh, is able to, with his the help of his sensor, to uh, move. Um, and to uh, avoid the different obstacles. Uh, uh, so um, if you want to use it, there is a web page with uh, you can download all the, the source code of this application. And it's available on the MIT's license. But uh, in fact, I have discontinued this, <laughs> this project because it's too <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, because it's too difficult because the uh, the the player stage program is very uh, is very a bad bad program because it's very difficult to interact with. There is a specific protocol, to you, so you need to read the C code in order to understand the, how it works. So it's very difficult. So the idea now is to use another uh, way to interact with uh, r uh, robots. So there is a new project called ROS. Uh, it's kind of a, a mid middleware for robotics uh, devices. And uh, it's based on uh, communication, based on XML RPC, and uh, uh, op hopefully it includes player stage. So I, I should, uh, if we if we use this kind of system, you can you are able to control player stage simulation by using uh, ROS. So, so I need to uh, I, I start to look at different kind of XML RPC implementation, but it's uh, uh, in, f in Faro or Squeak there is no mm, good. XML RPC implementation, so I have to uh, look at uh, mo it more, more carefully. So this is the end of the first one, and there is another one. <laughs> uh, so it's completely different. Uh, so it's another project that we launched several uh, weeks ago, uh, so it's, it's quite new, uh, very new. It's Faro for Sugar. <laughs> so it's a project with, uh, that we launched with Hilaire Fernandez. So Hilaire Fernandez is one of the guys, uh, is the main guy be, uh, behind uh, Dr. Geo. Uh, you know, this uh, software that runs on uh, OLPC uh, computers. 
and uh, so the idea is to port Faro to a uh, sugar environment. So you know that uh, there is already some, uh, there is already etoys on the sugar environment. So maybe you don't know why what are what is sugar. Sugar is a kind of um, a free desktop environment that is designed for for children, and it's mainly used in the OLPC XO laptops. But you can also use it in. Uh, on other on Linux laptops or Mac OS X laptops, very easily. And um, the idea is uh, to be able to to be able to deploy a, s a small talk application on, on this uh, on this platform, for example, Doctor Geo or other kind of software. And so we start some weeks ago to to think about uh, how to port Faro. So it um, uh, we so we have almost done. Uh, a sugar bundle, XO sugar bundle with uh, a VM and the Faro 1.1 image, so it's almost done. And we have some, in fact, we, we reuse the work of, uh, of Bert, uh, most of the work of from Bert, uh, the, the Dbus support. Dbus is a kind of middleware, so you can connect to the, to the hardware of the OLPC uh, by using Dbus. So we, it's mostly uh, work, we need to, to test it a little bit. Uh, we, uh, Ilea has done um, a very nice work by do doing a sugar team for, 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 for Faro. Uh, the idea, if, if we want to do some software, some application uh, uh, that are working on uh, sugar, we need to uh, have a sugar uh, UI that looks like sugar. Um, what should be done now is also to maybe to have some kind of binary package because it, if you load small talk application it's, uh, it takes a lot of time to uh, if you want to deploy very easily application on uh, XO hardware you need to to, to do uh, to do have something um, that is more faster than uh, today so we need maybe some binary packages and uh, also, maybe we need also to adapt uh, the multi-touch uh, implementation that is uh, provided in eToys because the maybe you in the future, the next version of the XO machine uh, will be provided with uh, some multi-touch interface. Okay, yeah. Uh, you have one? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, you can download the, the code here. Uh, we have meta shell configuration, so it's very easy to to download the, the uh, sugar for uh, Faro for sugar uh, in the Faro dot one dot one images, and I have a very small demo because uh, I have uh, don't have any uh, OLPC here, but I could uh, show you the. Uh the the sugar teams so uh, this is a sugar teams that is uh, provide on the image the idea is to be uh, to mimic uh, the the sugar U ui in uh, in faro okay thank you for listening Hello. 
Um, so after my Squeak presentation, um, a couple of people came to me and, and said, uh, I should have introduced eToys because they hadn't ever seen it. Um, so I thought I might do that today. Um, so it's, um, you go to squeakland.org and you, you can download, download it uh, there. And eToys is a thing uh, where you can, where children and grown-ups like me uh, can author projects, and it's really, real fun. Um, I'm not sure if I have the sound working here. Uh, probably not. Um, so I wanted to show you this, this uh, website here, so you can upload uh, stuff directly from eToys to, to the Squeakland uh, showcase. And then inside your web browser, there's Firefox running here, uh, we have a plugin, so it's, uh, it runs inside the web browser. And yeah, you, you, maybe you can hear it a little bit. Oh, the mic. Yeah. It's a little game someone someone did. Um, so you have to sort uh, the chords. So that is probably a minor, huh? Yes. No? No? Oh, it's a G7 chord. All right. Um, <laughs> whatever. I, I'm not really good at the, at the game. Um, and you can also just um, exit, uh, so go to full screen um, to, to do that. I could now modify uh, this project, or I can just uh, go back to the eToy start screen. That's how, how you would uh, start, uh, start out. Um, and when, when you start here, um, you, you have a couple of projects uh, to, to get introduced to it. Uh, also a little tutorial and demo. Um, so this one is, is just a, a thing that um, rolls. Um, so um, usually you start by by drawing something um, which becomes an object. Um, and uh, kids like to spend uh, a lot of time drawing, um, making it real neat. Uh, so. The little red car is kind of the, the icon of eToys, so that's usually the, the first uh, demo someone does. Um, we have an event recorder framework, so this is uh, just playing back events here. Um, and so a real shiny car needs some highlights, right? And it needs big off-road tires. And so once you're happy with your thing, you can just move it around. Um, you can bring up what we call the halo. You can scale it. You can rotate it. Um, so it has become an object. And then uh, the interesting stuff happens when you uh, open up the object and um, add behavior to it. Uh, you can do animations just by uh, collecting a couple of frames um, or by doing mathematical transformations. Um, you can do little games, so that's the complete source code to that game. Um, I'm not trying to steer it here. And we have particle simulation in there, so you can uh, do stuff that's, um, yeah, it, that requires a lot of objects to, to do. Um, we have uh, a little tutorial here. The, the challenge is a nice game to, that needs to be solved by uh, programming. Um, and in the gallery of projects, uh, there is some stuff to get you started. Um, for example, um, this one might be neat. Uh, so it's a little simulation. Um, so this is an inverter. And the way it works here is that when I take a power source, and I put it onto the red sensor, then that guy lights up. So it just changes its costume from yellow to black. And so by putting this here, um, we will get a feedback loop, right? And when I connect the little 
Yeah. So we have a couple of sounds in there. Croaking is really popular with the kids. Um, I we have, as I said, we have this particle model here. So this is currently simulating 2,000 particles. And this is the script that's executed for each of the particles. Um, and it's a, a little gas simulation. So there's uh, a lid weighing on, on the top of that um, container. And so if I reduce the particle count to 1,000, um, it slowly moves down. And you can probably guess what happens when I just increase the particle count by three um, to 3,000. Um, because they're confined in a really small space, they will uh, develop a lot of pressure. Boom. And there you can see the explosion and the shock waves. Um, and after a while, it uh, will settle down again. So that's a real simulation. Um, you can use eToys to do animations, but the cool thing about it is that you can also do simulations and it's used in schools worldwide. Um, as I said previously, it's pre-installed on the um, old PC laptop. Um, so there are 2,000 machines, uh, 2 million machines to date. And the, the number is growing. And so these are 2 million potential small talk uh, users uh, because actually what uh, what the scripts here are, um, so that's the little steering a car script um, where I can just use this um, this wheel to to show it um, to to control the car. Uh, I can switch to textual mode, and there's my small talk code. So that's what it gets compiled to behind the scenes. Uh, so usually we, we don't really show that, but that's one of the powerful features in eToys, that if something is missing, um, you can always add it um, just by escaping to, to Smalltalk code. Um, and the way the animation works is that you just um, click, uh, you tick this, this um, little clock icon here. Um, you can look inside the car and there are uh, all the messages it understands. Um, also stuff uh, that isn't really a message, but that we didn't have a nice idea where to put it. Um, there is, uh, those of you who are old enough to remember logo, um, we have a little pen here. So if I put the pen down and start going, then there will be a pen trail. Um, when I have this here, so you can see it a little bit better. And so with a little skill, I could even start to paint here. And you could imagine just implementing a little etch -a sketch or something like that. Um, what's also interesting is building a little robot car. We, we heard about physical e-toys and robots. Um, so what, what you would do here is instead of steering by yourself, um, you would start um, drawing a, a road for the car. Well, like this, maybe. And then we want to give the car a sensor. Um, maybe a green sensor here. And that's where it, where it looks. And then, oops. Then we can just say, okay, if, if the car's um, sensor do I need to go to the observation thing here? No. Oh, where is it? So it's a color test. Uh, a lot of uh, stuff in eToys are based on, on color tests. Uh, so when the car's green color sees the road, uh, it's fine. But when if it doesn't, it should turn turn a little and let's see no don't work so if the car sees the road and it goes forward maybe by five and if it does not see the road and it tries to turn okay and there's my car following the road <laughs> and that takes uh, about three lines of code yes that's the script and so that's that's fun 
Um, and how much more do I have? Did someone? <laughs> <laughs> Right on time. By the way, something important. Uh, the organization told me that tomorrow we will be leaving, we, we should be in the bus at four because they will block the street for us. So be prepared, huh? Because we, we, ca we cannot wait for people. And this is not leaving at four here, this is being there at four. Huh? So the student volunteer will uh, push you out of here anyway, but you should know it, huh? Okay, Janko. Okay, thank you. Last talk, I will be short, I hope so. Uh, translation support in small talk. This means multilingual translations. Tra your applications in many languages, okay? So, uh, what is the problem here? For instance, you have existing code with a text which is in some language, like, let's say English, in your code. And you like to translate in some other language or many languages. So we have now three questions here. How to migrate this code to be multilingual from single, ling uh, single language? The second question, where to store translations? And uh, third question, how to translate as easy as possible? So uh, this is a problem and let me show you this on the, the real example. So here we have, for instance, one web application, which is an, uh, in AIDA, but doesn't matter, uh, which is, uh, let me see, let me try to translate this part in some other language. We have Fran French now here, but it's still in English, as you see. Okay, we have one, so one title, we have some uh, links here and uh, also here. Let me translate this title uh, to something else. Okay, this is actually the method in AIDA which, uh, may, which is for this, uh, this part of uh, web page. And I uh, would like to make, for instance, this part, the title uh, multilingual. So we will, uh, we will prepare it to be translatable. So first, idea, first what we do, we just put this string to be not string anymore, but it's actually uh, association, yes? So, uh, and uh, what uh, I'm doing here, I'm saying that this is, this original text is in English. So I just put the uh, language uh, code here. I will say accept. Okay, so what we did now, nothing yet, because uh, uh, this is uh, still in uh, English, even uh, I'm French here. But uh, I put before uh, this, uh, uh, this thing into a uh, inline translatable mode. So if you can see, we can, I, I can actually uh, uh, translate this now here. Question, question de la celicrité, something like this. So, sorry for my 
Security without uh... okay and this thing is now actually already translated uh, in uh, even I that I have uh, here English way so question is now where is this translation stored yeah uh, no in files no we don't have get text idea here but it's not in file but simply in the method on the class side of this uh, uh, class which is uh, uh, which contained all those methods for um, uh, web application we also trans uh, uh, store translations and you hear here actually it's very simple way how to trans uh, to store uh, your translations of your application so you store in the method in the code and you can use your version control and everything to uh, manage your translations so this is the uh, the 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 idea here and uh, so we actually uh, solved all those free problem we uh, we simply migrate uh, code to be multilingual just by doing association uh, we stored them uh, into the uh, into the uh, class side methods and uh, we, uh, we provide inline translations so uh, some professional uh, translator can do this uh, very easily but just by clicking your uh, site so <laughs> to, s to, sim uh, to summarize this it is simple to migrate existing text Code is not cluttered, cluttered too much more with uh, those translatable thing, uh, stuff, and text is preserved in original long form. So if uh, if you have in English those text inside your code, it's still in English, uh, and this is much more easier to read and to maintain such code. So that's in my conclusion: simple migration of existing code again in place translation directly on the web pages. It's easy user, user interface for professional translators, I said, and that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, I probably want to. Actually, we we won't go this way probably because tra uh, some translator, professional translator, won't do this way anyway. He will just translate one page once and once, uh, uh, different pages uh, one one per one. So, but uh, uh, if you translate uh, some parts which are uh, reusable components, then those reusable components are already translated for others for uh, on the other page. So it is actually supported that way. Dynamic. This is not uh, here. We have just static text, but the dynamic text is uh, then uh, covered differently. Thank you.